All right, and we're live. What is up, everybody? Uh, I can't tell you how excited I am about today. Uh, I've had, it was a lovely trip out of town with the family. Apparently, uh, that's what you do with kids is you go on spring break, or if you're young enough, you go on spring break. Uh, I, I don't know. I've been the guy who... Um, didn't really do holidays. I used holidays as an opportunity to, to speed past uh, other people or take advantage of, of uh, things that were not getting done um, while everybody else was taking a break. So uh, that, that was kind of always been my strategy. But this week, uh, we went and <laughs> rented this great big house in Joshua Tree with another, my wife's, uh, one of her best friends who uh, family, uh, they just had a child who's a few weeks, maybe a month younger than Dexter. So um, it was a good time. Uh, but I, I don't know what happened today. Uh, just thinking, it's been a good amount of time um, thinking about this whole permissionless meritocracy. Right, the idea that nobody needs to give you permission, regardless of who you are. I've I've been really going hard on that. I, um, I really truly believe that there is a um, there's an opportunity to uh, to really help people realize that there are options that are truly out there. If you if you um, I mean, and and look, we're talking about trading. This is a specialized business, so it's. It's a tough thing to, you know, say that, but look, it starts here, you know, the way we do everything. Um, so I wanted to start out with two things. One, I'm going to start out with a quote that I added a little bit onto. Um, so Naval Ravikant, who's the founder of AngelList, which is a uh, startup based investing platform. It's where I do a lot of, uh, I, I, I get a lot of information and, you know, I, I do invest in startups in that asset class personally. Uh, and so on, on the, in the, you know, in our family um, and it's paid off over the years, uh, which is why I keep doing it. Also it, you know, even if I'm just doing a small amount every year, uh, it, it is something that you get your head in the game and you, and you just learn this abundant mindset. So look, even if you're doing, even if you're not investing in, in startups or any of that, which is a kind of a side rail from what we're about to talk about, the cool, the reason I do it is it, it is an abundant mindset. It teaches that, uh, it teaches me, it reinforces to me that you can either have a, a positive sum mindset and an abundant mindset on the world, uh, or you can have a, a zero sum mindset. And I'm not a fan of the zero sum mindset. I don't want to align myself with people within zero sum mindsets. I want to play long term positive sum games uh, with long term people, which is the original quote by Naval. Um, I added the positive people, long term positive sum games with long term positive people. So transactional relationships with people. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to share this with you because I'm not, you know, you'll, it'll ruin my edge. Um, you know, things like that, not interested in. Uh, and, you know, I'm happy to say that I would love, uh, I would love to, even, you know, even if you're not in that mindset, I would love to be able to convince you, maybe not you specifically who I'm talking, who don't think I'm pointing a finger at anybody here. Uh, but I would love the opportunity to, uh, by showing uh, first through actions and then teaching and helping, and then, you know, people learning about long-term positive sum games. So, uh, you know, if, if, you know, if, if you're quoting, you know, the market's a zero sum games, pal, like what's his name, uh, Gordon Gecko. Um, I'm going to, I want it to understand, I want, you know, I want to open this door uh, of long term positive sum games, because if you're playing long term positive sum games with long term people, then, you know, you're not, you're not jumping into, uh, I win, you lose. 
Like, so everything's a confrontation. Everything is, I have to come out on top or I'm a failure because I did not come out on top. And that's not a game I'm exiting. I have exited that game long time ago. And I'm, you know, I don't know if anybody in here is playing that game or not, but that's everything I think about. So long-term positive, some games with long-term positive people, you have the option to choose to think positively. You think somebody, uh, for example, we, we went to this uh, diner, side of the road diner, in the desert of California, just, you know, kind of podunk town. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting here, we're sitting down and, and I, have this, uh, I have this LA Dodgers hat on. Um, not really a Dodgers fan. I just like the hat. So, you know, say what you will. <laughs> uh, and this like cholo gangster comes out with his Dodger hat on. Uh, and, you know, it, very bl bright blue. Um, and, you know, sometimes in, you know, in, in the, you used to have to really worry about wearing uh, blue or red in California. Um, not so much a thing, but this dude was like cholo, like East LA sort of, sort of folk uh coming at me and just moving fast and he like lowered the brim on his hat and he's like yeah dodgers this is gonna be an amazing and he just started talking to me in like the most positive happiest vibe ever and i was just like i had a blast yeah i was like ah, i mean you know I'm, a, I'm you know kind of a fan but he's like yeah you know you rep la out here in the you know they don't love la they don't they they I guess there's a lot of people from LA moving out there and, you know, they're like prettying up the area. And, you know, a lot of people are kind of like, go back to your city folks. Uh, uh, but he's like, yeah, man, you know, you don't get, you don't see many people wearing LA hats out here. It's really cool. I'm really excited. It's funny. Um, and so I had this kind of perception and uh, you know, of my, uh, the, the people who are sitting with me kind of like, well, that was a weird interaction, you know, kind of like that. And I was like, look, that was a, that made my life. That guy was so happy. And then I realized the guy worked there and he's talking like that to everybody. And I'm like, holy crap, this dude just has awesome energy. And then uh, the lady, I think she was uh, one of the owners or, you know, whatever, who, who was um, grandma of five kids, uh, all boys, she says, he comes out and, you know, it's just happiest. It's just every single person at that restaurant that worked there was of the happiest mindset around. And I just thought to myself, I was like, look, if I'm going to do something like that, I want to surround myself with people like that. You know, I just kind of, it just really hit me. It's like, you know, long-term positive, some games with long-term positive people, you have a choice to be positive. And there's one thing's for sure. You're either, you know, well, not either, but people may look at you weird and think, God, that's a, you know, that guy's a little too positive. Tone it down, man. Um, or people are going to say, wow, that guy's really positive. And you know what, either one of those outcomes are the best outcomes I can think of that I would love for people to walk away with. Um, what I would rather not have is, uh, is people walk around with, um, you know, like, God, that, that, that guy is really negative. He really has a bad sense of, you know, the outcome of the world. He, like, he wants the world to burn. Like, I, that's not me. So I'm not the, I'm not that guy in any means. So I'm going to start that out. Uh, with that little soliloquy. Um, and then now I'm going to make it even longer. I'm going to do a, so Jeff Bezos, uh, there's, I have this book called uh, Invent and Wander, the Collected Writings of Jeff Bezos. Uh, great book. And there, a lot of them are basically taken from interviews, but most of them are annual reports to shareholders. Uh, and I, and I want to start with this one here. It's a quick one. So uh, it's, it's a page and a half in a book and it's titled thinking three years out. And this is Jeff. I like to putter in the morning. I get up early. I go to bed early. I like to read the newspaper. I like to have coffee. I like to have breakfast with my kids before they go to school. So my puttering time is very important to me. That's why I set my first meeting for 10 o'clock. I like to do my high IQ meetings before lunch. Hey, that's what we're doing right here. Anything that's going to be really mentally challenged is a 10 o'clock meeting because by 5 p.m., I'm like, I can't think more about this issue today. Let's try this again tomorrow at 10 a.m. Then on to eight hours of sleep. I 
prioritize sleep unless I'm traveling in different time zones. Sometimes getting eight hours is impossible, but I'm very focused on it and I need eight hours. I think better. I have more energy. My mood is better. And I think about it or, and think about it as a senior executive, what do you really get paid to do? You get paid to make a small number of high quality decisions. Your job is not to make thousands of decisions every day. So let's say I sleep, I slept six hours a day, or let's go really crazy and say I slept four hours a day. I'd get four so-called productive hours back. So if, if before I had say 12 hours of productive time during any waking day, now all of a sudden I have 12 plus four. Um, yeah, I have 12 plus four. I have 16 productive hours. So I have 33% more time to make decisions. If I was going to make say 100 decisions, I can now make 33 more, uh, 33 more. Is that really worth it if the quality of those decisions might be lower because you're tired or grouchy or any number of things? Now it's different if the company is a startup. When it's Amazon was 100 people, it was a different story. But Amazon's not a startup company and all of our senior exec executives operate the same way I do. They work in the future. They live in the future. None of the people who report to me should really be focused on the current quarter. When I have a good quarterly conference call with Wall Street, people will stop me and say, congratulations on your quarter. And I say, thank you. But what I'm really thinking is that quarter was baked three years ago. Right now, I'm working on quarters uh, on a quarter that's going to reveal itself in 2023 sometime. And that's what you need to be doing. You need to be thinking two or three years in advance. And if you are, then why do I need to make 100 decisions today? If I make like three good decisions a day, that's enough. And they should, be, they should just be as high quality as I can make them. Warren Buffett said he's good if he makes three decisions a year. And I really believe that. I didn't look up, so I'm glad nobody uh, entered into the, missed that part. Um, we could take that out and change, you know, the decisions part is trading, right? You can fall down that rabbit hole of making 133 small decisions, uh, you know, thinking you, you can do 133 small decisions a day. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we're really trying to do is we need to understand what, it, what we're working on. If we're working on a three-year goal here, then let's make small decisions that really have impact. And that's what we're going to focus on here. All right. So there, uh, if you can hear it in the background, let me know. There are cutting wood or, or cutting trees or uh, blowing leaves. <laughs> so if it's, uh, if it's noticeable, let me know. If not, I'll keep the window open and uh, carry on. All right, so what I did is I, I broke down, I like to work in objectives and KPIs uh, as opposed to you know, specific goals and not like, kind of like dialing in. Yeah, I have like a macro perspective of what I really wanna get after and what I visualize, you know, 21 million, that sort of stuff. But I really think it's important to have your objectives. And the objectives are a little bit outside your comfort zone, a little bit further. So they, they're, they're kind of, you know, you have to, you have to put an effort to do it. Uh, and then I build them around either four, six, eight week uh, time blocks. So what can I accomplish? 80, there's an 80 to 90% chance that I'm going to be able to accomplish the first thing. There's a 50% chance that I'm going to be able to accomplish the second thing. And there's a 10% chance. So that's your real stretch goal or stretch objective that I'm going to be able to uh, accomplish that third thing within my objective window. So, uh, you know, let's say it's a four week, a month long objective. I have an 80% chance of staying in the game. I think that's closer to 90, 95% chance. So, you know, maybe, maybe I need to push that out a little bit, but, uh, and focus more on the others, but, you know, and say 90, 50, 10, but, but that's, that's the way it works. So staying in the game is the main objective I have, because even if I can't do the 50% or the 10%, if I can stay in the game, that, keep, that gives me the opportunity to hit my 50% goal. I'm never going to be able to hit my 50% goal or my 10% goal uh, objective if I'm not in the game, right? So if you blow up your account, 
you're not able to do anything else. So that's why it's the number one uh, objective of mine. In fact, that's the number one rule in trading is stay in the game. So when we're talking about if, if the overarching drive is long-term positive sum games with long-term positive people, that feels great. But if you're not participating, then, you know, you got to go back and, and get back in, right? So you have to start over. So every time you blow up an account, every time you get, you know, your, your, you hit your stop lot, every time that happens, you have to start over. So the most important part of everything is stay in the game. The second thing is to hit your profit targets. So I pretty much have, I, I believe that it's a 50% chance that I'm going to hit 2% to, uh, to 5% profit target for the month. Again, we're talking on a four, four week monthly uh, sprint here. So that means I could have a, you know, a down 2% month, uh, 1%, 3%, right? I can't have a 4% down month because that, that breaks the first one, stay in the game. And then the final, um, the final target is hit your uh, progression profit target. So I'm specifically talking about city here, but it doesn't have to be that you, you can take it another way if you like, you know, you can look at FTMO and, you know, or top step or, you know, uh, any, any of the other routes, you can certainly look at it that way, but I'm going to, I'm going to focus on city uh, because we have the most people doing city right now. And uh, we have a very good blueprint of how to do it. And there's, you know, people I'm in there, uh, you know, there's other people in there so we can, uh, we can all help each other. Now, you know, there's other ones, but it, it, it changes a little bit, but it's still, all this stuff still applies, okay? So this is what it's going to take for me to hit my 80% objective. And I, I break down the steps because I need to keep my eye on the prize. I need to stay focused on what's important. And we'll get to what's important in a little bit here. But how do I hit my 80% objective? What are the steps that I need to implement? What things along, you know, what do I need to be doing every single day to make sure that I hit my 80% objective, which is stay in the game. So I need to visualize what it will be like to follow the plan. So just think about it. Like, you, you know, sometimes you just come up with an idea and you go. It's important. I find it very important to think about uh, what it'll be like to follow your plan. You know, what it will be like on day one, what, it'll, what it might be like on day 90, what it might be like on day 799, you know, like think about it, spend some time in there. Uh, and the next thing I need to do is build out the model manually back, back testing 45 minutes a day. I changed it from 60 to 45. You'll see. The reason I did six or 45 is because you're going to spend the other 15 actually implementing your trading. Um, and then before, after I do my 45 minutes of manual backtesting, then I visualize and review how I'm going to execute my, you know, what, it, what it's going to be like. So what are the steps I need to do? What, you know, remind myself, okay, I need to go through the universe, enter my trades in my spreadsheet for sizing and a sobriety check before entering your trades into your trading platform. Um, then I review my universe. So now is when I open up my chart. And for me, I use a single chart now. Uh, instead of having charts, all the charts together, I use one chart, pull it up, and then I just go through each one. That way I'm not getting caught up in other ideas like, oh, but what about the pound is strong? And what about the dollar? I, I have this theory that the dollar is actually going to be, you know, go down and uh, the euro is, uh, going to have some pain, but the pound's going to be, you know, like I have all these kind of mindsets in there, but it doesn't matter because when you review the universe and practice it daily, you can, um, you can take those trades like the, uh, uh, I think I got short. Remember, I, I, I'm kind of a longer term opinion on the pound is that, you know, we're going to hit that 150, 170, maybe $2 area on the pound versus the dollar. 
So I want to catch those big trends. But a couple of weeks ago, we got out of that. I got out of the uh, the high base uh, move that it put in and it started pulling back. And so I went short because there was a short setup and I took it. Uh, made a little bit of money and and then it turned and I had a failed vol breakout to the upside. So I it turned, I took that. So uh, by practicing every day, I reinforce the model and I take the, oh, I have this big view and I'm I'm a fancy uh, macro guy who does this weekly newsletter and I, you know, I gotta think about all these big things. No, nope, not me. I like you can hold um, two differenting, you know, differentiating different opinions in your head about things. So longer term, yeah, I have this bigger uh, view here, but you know, there are some tactical things that can happen. And so it works. Okay, now I've reviewed my universe, I found two to three trades, maybe. Um, I enter the trades into my spreadsheet first before I ever even open up the trading software. This is why I don't have, this is why I'm always saying, yeah, I kind of have an idea of where we're at on this or what my price is or all that sort of stuff. Cause I don't keep the trading platform open. I have the stuff in my spreadsheet. Uh, but you know, the only time I'm really in my spreadsheet is when I'm working or when I need to think through something on the model, compare or come to ideas or something like that but I'm not sitting around uh, you know, with my trading platform open. It's closed 99% uh, of the day. So on, you know, on the left side is my chart, on the right side is my spreadsheet. I enter in the date, check my uh, balance to make sure the account balance is correct. Enter in the, you know, the, the ticker, the, the setup, the regime, the entry, the stop, and the direction. And it spits out the position size. Uh, and I, you know, think about that for a minute. Okay, how much do I actually have exposed currently? Uh, and I'm working on a spreadsheet for that too. Um, and okay, got all that, got all that. Okay, good. Got my same things. And now it's actually really nice because now I don't need to go to the chart back to it. I just have my spreadsheet there. I fire up the, uh, I fire up the software. I you know, enter the trade, I look on my spreadsheet, tells me my entry price, and my stop loss price, and depending on the trade where my take profit is. Uh, and I enter that right into the software, hit send, and it's the orders are resting, waiting for things to go. Um, the sobriety check is the, uh, it, it's looking at the, um, I'm, I'm just seeing, okay, I've got, before I enter the trade, I've got, okay, GBP, USD long, EUR, USD long, uh, USD, JPY short, USD, CAD short. Mm, all right, so now I'm basically short the dollar four ways. Okay, so that's the sobriety check. Am I going to do all four of these trades or am I going to break them up into, you know, a, a, a tenth as opposed to a quarter, you know? Uh, how am I going to do that? So I just kind of think through all that stuff, right? Uh, I lock it in. So I hit enter and then I lock in like, what are my outcomes? What do I think, uh, you know, kind of scenarios, what's gonna happen potentially. Um, and if it, you know, like, okay, I got it. I think I got it figured out. And I've done this, you know, for 45 minutes a day for the last, I mean, I've done it for an hour a day for the last, you know, 15 something years every single day. So I'm not too concerned about it. I've practiced this thing millions of times, literally. Uh, so nobody, I don't think anybody else in the world has a million practice trades, uh, let alone, you know, as many live trades as I have of my strategy and this sort of thing. So I'm, you know, tomorrow I'm going to have another 20, uh, 20 or 30 trades more than, uh, than I did yesterday. And that's up against, that's something that the other traders out there, that are, um, you know, that, that are having problems and, and not consistent. So, you know, they're up against me getting 25, 30, 50 practice, you know, 50 in my mind, it's all it, it is. I, all I'm seeing is it's a, it's a trade. So I've moved from live trading to, you know, practice as this thing of, um, you know, it's, it's two separate things. And so when I'm practicing, it's the same way as if I'm doing it live which is one of the biggest reasons why I never leave my spreadsheet because I do all my work in my spreadsheet as I'm back testing, as I'm practicing. So why would I do it differently? 
if I'm going to be doing it differently in real life, why don't I do that in my practice? So doing it differently in real life versus doing it in your practice, your real life trading should look exactly like your practice trading. So if it's, if you have a whole fancy setup, I know some of you do, um, this is where you really need to think about that because if you're practicing differently than the way you're working, that's not how you do it. That's the wrong way to do it. All right. So how do you hit your 50% objective? Visualize what it will be like to follow your plan. Build out your model by manual backtesting 45 minutes per day. Visualize your review and execution. Review your universe. Enter trades into spreadsheet for sizing and sobriety check. Enter trades and adjustment into your software after you've done your spreadsheet. Uh, lock it in and walk away. How do you do to your 10% objective? Exactly the same way. Visualize what it will take to uh, follow your plan. Build out your model by manually backtesting 45 minutes per day. Visualize your, your review and execution. Review your universe. Enter trades in spreadsheet for sizing and sobriety check. Enter trades and adjustment into software. Lock it in and walk it and walk away. See that your plan should achieve the 10% objective, you know, the, the once or twice out of the year that you're actually going to be able to hit your 10% objective, you should be doing it every single time the same way, because the likelihood that you'll hit your 10 would be consistent. And that means that your 50% and your 80% are going to be fairly consistent. So don't, so when you're building these things, they want to be the same. So you're not jumping around, right? So you're not uh, okay, well, you know, I hit my, I hit my 80% objective. So now it's time to focus on my 50% objective. If you build the model correctly, you get your random 10% objectives. You get your, you know, every, you, you get about, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight times out of the year, you get your 50% objective and, you know, probably like 10, 11, 12% percent of the time or 10 to 12 months out of the year, you hit your 80, 90% objective, right? So that's, your plan should be the same. So then you need to know what your models are, right? So if you know what your model is, you know if you are, if you are um, performing to the model. Basically, in my models, my best years have a 200% ROI. Average year has 100% ROI and a below average year has a 30% ROI depending on what I'm trading, which uh, asset, which risk, and uh, which um, uh, setup, right? Am I, in the, am I in the trend? Am I in the mean reversion or whatever? Okay. I focus on the market regimes and get the appropriate strategy. So I don't just go and grab a strategy and then, then try to wedge it into the market regime I'm in. I have, all I need to do is figure out what regime I'm in and I just pull the strategy that I need off the shelf and there I go. You know, I'm not, it doesn't have to be SQN. Understand that there's two main market regimes. It's either trending, you're either trending or mean reverting. Now, the way we do it with SQN is we have high volatility, low volatility along with these trends and the direction. But if you're on a trend day, you know, then you're looking to bust out the trend strategies. If you're in a trend month, then you're used looking to bust out the trending months, you know, the trending strategies. If you're in a mean reversion year or two, well, you're using mean reversion strategies the majority of the time, right? So there's all these things. And it's just understand that the, the complexity of SQN or any of these things is not, not the... Um, is not that difficult. It comes down to those two things. How you attack a trend a trending market is different than how you attack a, uh, a mean reversion market. You need to trail stop, you know, get in, get pulled into a trend, uh, understand that as we talked about yesterday, at the beginning of a trend, usually they don't pull back as hard if it's a really strong trend. Uh, as you get to the top and you continue to break out, you're usually in a, a strong uh, uh, like a peak, and that's where the volatile type market is. And so if you get a massive blowout, like we saw on gold, as we were looking at yesterday on the monthly gold, had a massive um, blow off top, and the pullback was much harder because you're, you're in volatile 
right? Once, once you're changing more than 1.6% on the day, uh, or, you know, yeah, on the day is what we use, uh, then the characteristics are different, right? In a bull quiet or bear quiet in currencies, it's just a low, soft drift. You'll just see bar after bar after bar heading in your direction in nice, small moves. The Dow's doing it right now. Um, just nice, easy moves. Do, 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 do. And then when they start being really big, big moves on a day-to-day -day basis, week-to-week, month-to-month, whatever it is, hour-to-hour, -hour, well, then you know you're in a volatile regime. And so that there's stuff that happens in a volatile regime that's different than happens in a quiet regime. Um, same with mean reversion. You have to understand in mean reversion, you want to take profits. Uh, Al Brooks calls it a limit order market, right? Where it, you're just banging around between price levels. What you want to avoid doing is getting really starry eyed that you caught the beginning of a mega trend. Because remember, when you're in a mean reversion market, you know, mean revert, mean reversion timeframes last about 80% of the time. They last the vast majority of the time. So thinking that you got the absolute best experience uh, as a, you know, as a, at this trade, you know, the, that could be the case, but the reality is if you got bottom tick and you're long, uh, the likelihood of that happening is very rare. And if you, if you're thinking that way, then you, you're not confident. You haven't practiced enough. You need to keep practicing the way the market works. You need to learn that, oh, it's not a problem. If I, I could get, this could end up being a really good trend, uh, I want it, you know, I could have had the absolute lowest tick and have the, you know, have this thing rock for forever. But, you know, your reality is, is if you have a good trending strategy where you can identify how to get into low risk entries into a trend and add to it, well, then, then you don't, it, you know, there's no uh, zero sum mentality of, okay, I got this bottom tick and, you know, I'm, I'm the best, right? You're, Rather, you can just say, okay, cool. I got my bottom tick. I uh, hit my profit target. I hit, you know, that's a 70 something percent win rate thing. I'm to my model. That's a perfect modeled trade. Oh, it's continuing to go. Okay, cool. It looks like we might have a trending market. Now let me bust out the trending strategy and get pulled into a nice trend instead of trying to catch the, the absolute perfect entries. So let's talk about the model we have for um, City. Now, this could be, think about this. this you know, this is modeled at, um, at about, you know, what my strategy is combined with all the different strategies. Now, it could be half of this. You might even want to consider that it's going to take half of this. And what does it look like? Think about what your life is going to look like as a prop trader at a firm like City. What is their incentive? Their incentive... They're incentivizing. What is it that they want? What is it that the firm you're working with wants? Well, they want long-term consistent returns. It's kind of nice that they have so many people thinking that they're uh, the best, that they're magically going to become a, a, the best trader in the world when they put up their $200, $500, $700 uh, tryout fee. Uh, but I will tell you, 96% of people who try out for City fail. So only 4% of people who try out for city actually make it. So for them, they're looking for that 4%. And the 4% is really not what most traders think about. They think that they, they, they don't. So, okay, city will give you money to make trades on their, uh, for their account, especially if you don't lose 4% and if you can take your time earning 12.5% at each level. There's nothing in the rule books that says you have to hit 12.5% in a week. In the tryout, you can't even do it. It, it takes at least, uh, you know, at the best day. If you took a single trade Remember, we talked about this 50% uh, 50, uh, uh, 50 win rate uh, strategy on a day trade that made 1.5 or 2R on a winner and lost 1R on a loser. Um, theoretically, that would, you would hit the price target 
profit target in six weeks and uh, the time target as well of 30 trading days. So the minimum, the minimum to get into City is six weeks. Uh, it took me two and a half months. I think it took Grant a little bit longer. Uh, Simon, I think it was three months, he said. I don't know anybody else who's, uh, who, who's made it through City yet, but I know we have a bunch of people currently in the middle of that. So um, understand that you know it's about three months to hit your first uh, profit, profit and time goal. And, you know, some of you are day traders and that, that's a, totally fine. Uh, some of you are swing traders like myself, totally fine. As long as you have the model that, that will hit it. Um, if you don't have the model, don't waste the money. You know, there, there is a 96% <laughs> chance that you're not, that you're going to waste your money. Now, it's, I, I don't think it's a wasted money. I guess I shouldn't say that because you are learning something and you're improving and you're getting better. So when you have a little uh, skin in the game there, I think that, that there is value uh, with that. So I'm not, too, you know, I'm not wholly against the idea of not having a, a model that can mathematically achieve, the, um, achieve the, the profit target risk parameters. But I do think that uh, you, know, you should. <laughs> you should be working towards that. Uh, and that's what the everyday practice, uh, manually backtesting, collecting the data into your spreadsheet so that you know what you should expect. So if you have your model, then your model, my model says that I have a possibility of earning about $45,000 this year uh, with City. I have a, um, so what does that look like? Half of it will come in the last two months. So basically, I'm uh, not really earning too much throughout the, uh, throughout the year, but towards the end of the year, or you know, maybe it could take two years to actually hit, the uh, you know, hit that level. I'm aware of that. I have other things to do. So you know, I'm not, my family isn't uh, relying on this today. The reward is or you're rewarded to be consistent and low risk, right? So you need to, you need to condition your mind to be focused on the, the, what the reward is and what the incentives are. So if you don't have the, if your incentive is to make, you know, $750,000 the second year at City, you need to realize that it's, it's next year, maybe even the third year that you're actually going to earn it. Uh, it's, not, it's not this year. So have that mindset. Know that you're playing the long-term game, which is why it, you know, I only do an hour a day on this. Because if I spend all day doing it, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss the opportunity. And I'm going to get stuck in the other opportunity of short-term uh, negative sum thinking instead of this long-term thinking. Most of us in this room have, uh, you know, let, let's say at least 50 on, at today's level, at, at the ages that have typically been going, probably going to have another 50 years of life. Now, I believe that there's probably, you know, that's going to increase dramatically, maybe 100 years, 200, maybe eternal. Uh, but for now, you know, pretty much we, we've all got at least 50, 70 years more, 100 years more of life. Uh, and if you're, you know, if, if, if you can get your mindset into that long-term positive sum game, it'll, it'll get you there a lot, lot sooner. Okay. So keep your eye on the ball. Understand what, where you're at. This is the, this is the thing that I think most people are going to um, be excited about. Uh, getting reinforced. Think about this every day. Your first three months, they're gonna. If if you do city and you pass the tryout, they're gonna PayPal you six hundred and twelve dollars. No matter how much you make them, you make ten thousand dollars for them. They're gonna they're gonna send you six hundred and twelve dollars. They're not even refunding your tryout amount. 
They're, you're so they're still making money even on the four percent that actually uh, try out and succeed. They're still making a profit on that. So city is, you know, their incentives are to get the absolute best through. And they're, you know, probably going to have a lot more money for you at the end of that. If you're of the, if you're the 4%, that's an elite, elite group. So the next three months, you're going to make about $2,500 a month. So six months in, you're making $2,500 a month in returns, splitting it with city. Uh, so it kind of doubles for the, up until you get to your $2 million mark. But if you understand that it's going to take you about nine to 10 months before you're making about four to $5,000 a month, that's important to realize. You need to keep that in your mind. Most people have this, uh, uh, $5,000 is a fairly common price level for most people to think about, okay, I can trade professionally. Uh, just like any starting any business. It takes like you start an e-commerce website or a, um, a podcast or, you know, anything. You don't make the big amount of money in the first year or two. You know, you, you put together an e-commerce website, you know, you may sell one thing a month, your first month, two things the next month, four things the next month, eight, you know, it slowly works. So, which is nice because you can have a couple of these sort of businesses that slowly start to work together, right? Um, you're going to want to have something to do outside of this 45 minute of manual backtesting and 15 minute of actual trading per day. You're going to want to have something else in your life. Um, whether it's a, another job, right? Whether it's uh, learning to code whether it's uh, writing, whether it's, uh, you know, researching crypto with us, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, hiking and, and uh, you know, exercise and school or learning or things like that. whatever it is, you're going to want to fill your time with other things. So about a year in, the last two months of the year, you're making about 10K a month. So every three months or so, may take four, five, six months, you're going to double your income for the first two years, give or take. So that's kind of, that's a nice, easy way. Three months, thinking three months out is not that hard. You know, thinking about three months, I'm going to double what I'm making right now in three months, right? That's a lot easier to wrap your head around and a lot, you know, a lot more comfortable than thinking, okay, well, you know, I'm only going to make $600 for three months. So it's nice that you have that added little carrot every three months that you get a, you double up your pay. Not many jobs in the world where you have that opportunity to work, spend one hour a day working and double your pay every three months. So if you can find that in any other type of work, you should also be doing that. Then finally, when you get to the $2 million PM uh, level, uh, it increases your, your monthly return will increase about 5% a month. <laughs> Again, you know, most jobs I know have a 3% cost of living uh, pay increase per, per year, right? That's, that's a pretty common thing. Uh, you're increasing when you get up to that PM level. First of all, your first two years, you're doubling your salary every three months. Not many jobs do that, if at all. Uh, second cool thing is two years into it, uh, you get a two years into it, you get a 5% monthly increase. <laughs> you know, that that's insane how much money that that is compared to what you're doing at, uh, a job, right. Working for somebody. So there's not really a lot of, like, again, I find me, find me a place that you can double your income every three months. And then after about two years, increase your income by 5% every month. Uh, you know, and, and I think you should have that as your other line of work to keep you busy, maybe. So here's what the yearly potentials actually look like. If you're doing if you're, this is my plan, 
now, you know what, I'm willing to uh, move every year, move this, you know, take, it may take two years to get to the 45K, uh, three years to get 750, four years to two, uh, two, four, you know, like it, this could go out, um, this could go out in a, in a different way, right? This may take twice as long as we have modeled out. And that's, you know what, it's fine because it's an hour a day. So just keep, keep the eye on the prize. And, you know, I'll kind of get into something here towards the end of that. But within your, by your second year, you, you could have earned $750,000 a year. Again, there's not many lines of work that you can earn this much money for an hour's work a day, right? That's it. An hour a day to make $750,000, an hour a day to make $2.1 million a year, an hour a day to double that, an hour a day to double that. There's not many lines. Find me another job where you can double your income every year with no cap really, right? On an hour a day's worth of work, on an hour of day, an hour a day's worth of work. Find me that career and I say, you should do that along with this. <laughs> the dangers. Uh, these are the big pitfalls that I see most people fall into when they're doing this line of work. The biggest pitfalls I see when people are doing these tryouts uh, and trying to, trying to achieve these goals. The first biggest one is they try out everywhere. I granted, I kind of like popped around and did kind of like did a bit of a analysis on all of them too. But um, taking on too many accounts at once, unless, you, unless you've worked up to multiple accounts, uh, it's a really hard business to be in. So uh, focus on one account. It's kind of expensive to do two or three accounts just to sign up. Uh, so do one. You can't, you can't do two or three if you can't even do one. Think about that. Let's play long-term games. Let's keep our eye on the prize. Let's not get caught up in all the shiny different things. Let's just focus and get one at a time. Okay? So if you've got multiple accounts open, hopefully those other accounts uh, don't have a time limit. So choose the one with the best outcome and start following that one. Next danger that people have on this is they get derailed from their strategy. Uh, you know, you, you kind of start, oh, uh, yeah, I know what's going on here. I'm going to do this. Oh, I think I know what's going on here. I'm going to do that. I'm going to take it. I'm going to, uh, you know, like getting caught up too much and not following your strategy, getting caught up in, in uh, narrative or uh, I've had so much success recently. Uh, I know exactly what the market's doing. So I'm just, what I decide to do is what I'm going to do. And I don't need to follow my strategy. They're going to get, you know, that that's where the drawdowns happen. Um, also having too many strategies. Well, I skipped one. Thinking you need to be the world's most complex PM. Uh, you don't need to have an opinion on where interest rates are going. Uh, you don't need to have an opinion on inflation, deflation. You don't need to have an opinion on uh, Tesla stock. You don't need to have an opinion on uh, President Biden. You don't need to have an opinion on Xi Jinping or, or uh, the uh, you know, energy, green new energy, green new deal or whatever. Like you don't need to you do whatever, but don't let it, um, that's not, you don't need to have an opinion on that to be successful as a trader. You need to focus on your strategy. That's it, just one strategy. Um, a lot of people think that they need to have more strategies. If one is good, 10 is better. Uh, and then you're, I have a long setup here. I have a short setup here. Uh, crap. And then there's, then you have like conflicting trades across the board and you choose the wrong one each time. Or, you know, you have like, for example, the high base. Uh, let's say it, let's say it does take off one of those. Let's say I'm in a VBO2. What do I know about how long I'm in that trade? That's something that's really useful to know, right? 
how long are you in that trade? Well, if it, you know, if it takes off, uh, and the way I run the VBO is I let it break out and I continue to trail, uh, trail stop. Um, well, you know, that thing takes, let's say 42 days on average to hit, uh, to, to, to run its course. Uh, okay, cool. And then you throw a strategy that has a 10 day average to run its course and they kind of conflict. And so you decide to take the the one that lasts the longest, and you can have both trades within that whole campaign, right? You can have VBOs, VBO twos, along with failed ball breakouts, all the way through. Uh, that's why it's important to use market regimes to keep you focused on which strategy to apply, so that you're not trying to constantly outthink the market. The market will, the market is uh, the craftiest street criminal you can imagine they are constant they are a little it's on meth uh there's these meth farmers have you heard of this term meth farming where these kind of homeless meth people they treat they they you know they steal and then sell things to to make money but they treat certain neighborhoods and houses and things that they steal to resell for a you know uh, a hit um, and they treat that area as a farm. So they tend to it. They, they don't steal something too much. Like, yeah, they could steal the TV or the, a computer and get a you know, good amount of money for it. But really what they're looking to do is get something that they can sell for 10 bucks or whatever. I don't know what meth costs, but, um, just kidding. I do it every day. <laughs> no. Um, I, you know, they, they basically kind of like work these neighborhoods and they have this whole thing. It's, anyway, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> That was a sidetrack. <laughs> okay, um, you just need uh, you need to have one amazing, one good strategy that you can practice and trade and do every single day. Uh, and if you can't, then you don't need ten. You need one. You need one. You need one account, one tryout, one prop account. You need one strategy. Uh, you need one hour. That's the thing is the focus and the long-term positive sum games. And then, you know, if you think to yourself, I should have put quotes on these two. Uh, I will show them how fast I would get to a $2 million portfolio. That's the fastest way to get your 4% uh, stop out. Think about this. You're nine months, 12, 14, 18 months into it, and you're running a million dollar portfolio or, or $700,000 portfolio, whatever it is. Um, and you hit your 4% stop out. Guess what you got to do? Just like Monopoly. <laughs> Start over. You got to go back to zero, not one. You got to go back to zero. And you fire up your $787, whatever it is, fee to try out again. And then you spend three months slowly working your way up to uh, work your way up to uh, that profit target, right? 12.5% profit target. You'll make $612 doing that over the, that's $200 a month, not $600 a month. It's $200 a month that you're going to get. So, and then finally, the biggest danger is forgetting about incentives. If you have the opinion that you're going to show city how fast you're going to be able to hit all your different profit targets, you're forgetting about the incentives and you're going to look, you're going to end up in a, you're going to end up in a bad spot, right? You're going to end up losing everything and having to start over. So a KPI, a key performance indicator. So something you're going to want to do to keep track of your, how you're doing. First of all, remember, we have the same plan to achieve uh, 80, 90% objective, 50% objective, 10% objective. Hopefully, if you structure that correctly, it's going to look that way the whole way through. You're going to have to come back and reiterate every, every, at the end of every sprint. Uh, and figure out what it is that, you know, maybe you improve it just a little bit. That's fine. You don't need to know what you need to know. You don't need to know anything about running a $2 million or $10 million portfolio when you're running a $17,500 portfolio yet. You're going to learn all along the way 
what you're going to need, but you don't need to know the, the ending today. You just need to know what you need to do to get to the next step because you don't get the opportunity to get the, the, the big game, the, the two or $10 million portfolio. You don't get the opportunity to get that until you've accomplished your, you know, your, your first objective, which was not your, to stay in the game, not get locked out of the game. Second objective is to hit the price target, uh, profit target. And you, you know what? You do it. It takes time, but you do it. And the third objective, occasionally you'll hit that, which is you just have a good month and it just runs. So if you want to be lucky, right? You want to set yourself up to be lucky when the market is firing on all cylinders and your strategies are the perfect strategies for that type of market. You want to be there for that. So you need to deal with the rest of the time where you're not, where it's not, you know, a hundred percent win rate and like 20 R per month. You want to be in the average ones, right? You want to be where it's, where it's good. Um, your average win versus your average loss matches your model. So if your average win is 1.5 R and your average loss is one R, then when you're trading live, if your average win is 2.1 R and your average loss is 1.8 R, you're doing it wrong. Uh, if your average win is uh, 3 R and your average loss is 1 R and in your model, you're, you're at 1.5 R and your average and, and negative 1 R. Well, you know what? Maybe you're, maybe you're underperforming. Maybe go back in time and see, you know, like do an equity curve and see, or, or you know, your average return per month and see you know, see what it is. Were there periods where you went from th average 3R to 1.5R? You can do that. All this stuff's in the spreadsheet. That's why putting the data in the spreadsheet is the important job. So 45 minutes a day, and in addition to practicing, you're collecting the data. Collecting the data is what gets you, it unlocks all this information. Then you go to your spreadsheet and you can like, you may not, you may not know how to run a query in the spreadsheet to get the answer you're looking to get done, but ask the question, say, Hey guys, I, how do I separate? I want to, I want to create a table that shows me the average return per asset, per regime, per setup by month. How do I organize that into a table? I have 800 trades. I have over a thousand trades in this spreadsheet. How do I get that done? Well, we'll come up with it. We'll figure it out. That's not your job. Your, your job, don't, don't not collect it because you don't know how to, you know, you don't, you know, it, you don't know that you can actually organize that data. The reason we organize that spreadsheet the way it is, is because that's, it's data we can pull, right? At a later date, you're going to be better at, at Excel or Google Sheets uh, three months from now, if you're working in them every day, you're going to be better six months from now, a year from now, two years from now. Uh, also, you're in a group of fellow traders that, are doing that scene. They may have the question, ask the question, go into the group and say, Hey guys, um, I, uh, yeah, I would like to, you know, I, I have my, you know, I've done my back test. It's kind of sloppy or, you know, I want to organize it by a different way. I, I want to know this. How do I know this? You know what? We'll put our heads together. We'll come up with an idea. We got people who are fantastic. Uh, you know, we have developers in here. Maybe they'll say, you know what? I would like to do that too. I'm going to build a SQL database. And I'm going to just run some queries on it. And we'll, you know, we'll kind of put it all together. You've collected a thousand trades. I've got a thousand trades. Let's merge them in here and see if we can, you know, get interesting insights out of it. Like there's, there's cool things we can do having a team like this, having a, you know, a bunch of fellow traders that look, the, 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 um, we all benefit from it. So a lot of times you, there's people in the group who are highly skilled in Python, in, in SQL, in Excel, in, um, you know, uh, understanding the math of a, an indicator or, you know, like uh, the, the inner workings of the different products, you know, like there's people in there. So if, maybe sometimes just ask the question. Sometimes you just mean maybe like, you know what? I don't know the question. And if you haven't done the courses yet, by the way, uh, you will lightning accelerate your skills at getting, being able to run these sort of, this sort of business uh, with the system mastery course. So uh, I didn't really think about pitching that. <laughs> it just, I know that 
if you haven't done the systems mastery course, um, you're, you're a little, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to gain there. Um, you know, you, you can learn with the group here. And a lot of us have learned a lot from the group without doing the systems mastery course, but I would, um, I would encourage you if you're really serious about doing, uh, trading this way as a, for your life, then, uh, consider doing it. And if you haven't bought it and you want it, uh, as a member of the, of the, uh, trading lab, I'll hook you up with the 50% discount. So DM me if that's what you want to do. That was kind of a side note, but, um, okay. Back to it. The other thing, again, you know, if you have the model, you can match what you're doing in real time with what you're doing, what was done in past, which is another reason why my, I use my same spreadsheet that I use to manually backtest is my live trading because all the inputs are the same. I'm using the same math. I'm using the same stuff. There's nothing, there's nothing different in there. Uh, there's nothing in there that's different. That's keeping me from, uh, that's having me do it differently. Right. I'm waking up and, and doing the exact same thing every day, which is very useful. That way I'm, not using an old spreadsheet uh, to collect data and new spreadsheet to try to enter the data. And then now I got to spend all day trying to figure out the formulas and see, are they the same formulas or not, right? Just use the exact same thing. Then you're comparing exactly the same stuff together. Uh, you're not comparing things differently. Um, and finally, look, this one is a, this is a, a qualitative. The, the first three KPIs were quantitative. You got to know, are you calm or are you anxious when you're putting these trades on? If you're calm, that means you're practicing. That means you're doing this and you're confident in your skills because you've got enough trades on. Uh, you, you've practiced. You know, you get to the free throw line in, the, in a basketball game and you start shooting free. You have, to, you have two free throws to shoot. Um, if you've practiced it enough, you're going to be calm. You're going to know how to do it. If you haven't practiced your free throws that much, you're going to be anxious. You, you know, you're like, oh crap, I'm, you know, like you're going to start thinking all this other stuff. Uh, golf, same thing, you know, like anything driving. If you haven't driven a car in, in two or three months, you're going to be a little anxious when you get in that car for the first time and kind of roll out and, you know, you're going to be driving a little bit slower. We've all gone through those sort of things. Maybe it's because I've lived overseas so much and not driven and driven and, you know, <laughs> that it maybe is a little different, but um, this is a qualitative thing that just think about like, are you calm or are you anxious when you're putting your trades on? If you're anxious, if you're in a drawdown and you're not, you know, like you kind of, if you're in a drawdown and you've gone through drawdowns during your back testing, you should be calm. If you're in a drawdown, and you're lost, you're completely lost, and, or, or I'm sorry, you're, you're really anxious, then you know, that's telling you something. You, you haven't been practicing. And it's really important to get in there and practice every day. You're collecting the data. You're rewiring your mind to see the setup over and over. You're rewiring your mind to be calm because you're practicing in a calm state. So when you do it enough times, in that calm state, when you get to the, you know, game time, you're going to be a lot calmer because you've got the reps in. It's a little bit different, but once you, once you've done it so many times, it's not different at all. It's exactly the same. So those are the KPIs, the key performance indicators, keep track. You should always know what your average win, average loss, what your SQN currently is. Uh, are you at your average win rate? Uh, you know, all the, all the data, are your profit factors, you know, all that sort of stuff. Are they the same or are they off? And then the quantitative or the qualitative one is like, are you feeling anxious and kind of, you know, spazzy or are you comfortable and like, ah, yeah, I got this. This is, this is easy days. So the last thing I want to talk about here is think about, okay, this is three years out from now five years out from now, 10 years out from now. If you don't have kids yet, you may have kids. Uh, if you have kids already, they're going to be older. Uh, if you're single and just kind of, you know, doing a thing, you, you may have a partner. Um, 
you you may never have a partner. You may never have a family. That might be your choice. Cool. I, I mean, I did that for 40 something years of my life. Um, but understand people are relying on you to be successful in the future to, you know, don't, don't think that success is a bad thing. Don't, don't think that, oh, you know, I'm, if I'm successful, somebody is losing. That's not the case. This is what positive sum games are. If you're successful, you can help other people be successful, whether it's just by leading by example, uh, whether it's, you know, using your success to help other people become successful, you know, journeyman apprentice, uh, whether it's um, donating, whether it's, uh, you know, getting out and, 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 you know, helping, whether it's uh, inventing, whether it's coming up with new ideas um, in the world, uh, you know, getting, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe you could use your 23 extra hours a day minus this, you know, six to 10 hours, <laughs> whatever, eight hours of sleep. Uh, maybe you can use that the rest of that time to do things like um, learn, learn physics, learn astrophysics, learn biology, learn math, learn poetry, you know, learn to write poetry, like all these other things that you can be a gift to the world for, or, you know, you can help enable other people to be uh, better. Think about this as your responsibility. Like I need to do this, not so that you can have it. Look, I'm not, no judgment. If you're, if you're into Lamborghinis and, you know, like private jets, and that's what you want to do with your time and money. That's exactly what you should do with your time and money because it's your time and money. Um, there's, you know, it's, it's not, there's no judgment that you need to be an inventor. You need to be a philanthropist or you need to be a teacher or anything like that. Nope. You can definitely be an example to people uh, driving around in Lamborghinis and flying in private jets because people are going to look at that and say, oh man, I really want whatever, you know? Um, so cool. Uh, also, you know, you don't need to be the person who's donating all your wealth to the church or to the, to the needy or to, uh, you know, anything. Exactly. You need to think about that. Your family is relying on you. You know, I'm thinking about, this is personal for me, my family is relying on me to be successful at this endeavor. Um, my son is relying on me to keep the family. My wife is relying on me. You know, my, my brothers and sisters, my mom, uh, my dad, my, my relatives, the, the people I know uh, that are part of my family, they're relying on me. Like what happens if my what happens if my parents and, and you know, uh, wife, parent, what, what happens if they live to 120 years old and they only have savings to live to 85 years old? You know, they, they didn't do it right. Uh, the world changed on them. They thought they had a plan. They didn't, they didn't adjust their plan with new information. Well, you know what? What am I going to do? Am I just going to be like, oh, sorry, old person, go to the home. We can't wait till you're done. Like, that's not, that's not what I'm interested in. I don't know if you are or not, and there's no judgment if you are or not. That's, I'm happy that you... I'm happy that you, uh, you, know, you have the freedom for that choice, but you have optionality. Um, the world is relying on you to do this. Again, even if it's just that you're an inspiration uh, or, you know, I, I think it's really important that, that 3.5 billion people get electricity and internet. That's half the world. Do you imagine how far the world has come since the early 90s when uh, the developed world got the internet? or you know, well, I'll say developed in, in that you have uh, electricity <laughs> and you were able to get wires to connect uh, from a computer to a computer. Um, there's still a lot of the world that doesn't have th half the planet, half the population of the world doesn't have the internet. Um, not to say that you, know, you're, you being a trader is gonna you know, help the rest of the world get internet, but it's something to think about. Imagine if you were making you know, 10, $20 million a year uh, for an hour's worth of work a day, and you could help, you know, use some of that money to get electricity across the world or uh, find people who, who were doing it, you know, whatever. But think about it, the world is relying on you. And um, there's, there's just, it's, I, I don't want to be throwing my uh, ideas of things that are interesting to me to you. But again, you know, lock in the responsibility take responsibility and lock that in. If you're responsible, if you take the responsibility of, of you can change other people's lives for the better and make the world better, 
um, by making yourself better, that's a pretty awesome thing. And that comes back to the positive sum game. This is all positive sum. You can, by doing this, by being successful, you can help make the world better. At, imagine if 3.5 billion people got internet, power and internet and water, and we're trading. Ha! Imagine what the market would look like. Imagine if they were building things. Imagine if they were um, learning things and creating things. Like that's a whole, if you just look at what the, how the world has changed from like 1992 to today because of the internet alone, just the internet. Like a lot of you weren't even born then, I'm sure. But um, a lot of us can remember a time before the internet existed. Uh, and, you know, how incredibly cool it is that you can just not have to get in the car, drive to a library, chase down a book, try to find a book that has the answer, read through the book, not have it, you know, spend two or three weeks just trying to come up with one single answer uh, in, on this, you know, uh, wild goose chase to come up with the answer. You can just hit the Googles and now your job is to figure out how to, or duck, duck, go. Uh, your job is to figure out how to ask the question good. Well, So you can make as big an impact on the world as you want if you, um, if you do this. It's totally available. All right. I kind of missed going over the markets today, but I think this is more important. Um, there's a bunch of comments there. Uh, I'll look into that real quick. Uh, but you know, I think, I think this was way more important than staring at uh, a couple of charts and talking about uh, you know, my thoughts on where the market might be headed or whatever. Um, market's up. All right. Let's have a look. Crypto Ethereum back over, uh, 2000. Um, everything's just sitting right there. I, I really love this, uh, FTSE trade. Um, really starting to look good. Got in over here up, uh, one, half, probably about 2% up since getting in. Um, nice little trade. Uh, let's take a look at currencies on the year. Uh, Dollar is continuing to put that move down. CAD up, pound holding stable, Aussie up, Kiwi up, Euro up pretty good, Franc up pretty good, the Yen up pretty good. Um, this is old trades, Aussie Yen. Dollar yen. I I'm uh, yeah I uh, I'm out of those uh, out of all those. So Ethereum back up and running. Uh, Bitcoin up and running. Cooled off. Uh, kind of cooling off a little bit after last week's run. Remember, we've got what the world could possibly be. Uh, we could be at a very big inflection point, signaling the Russell. Who knows? No bear porn. Uh, all I know is that the UX v, or UVXY, the, the VIX trade, is continuing to lose money, and that makes me happy. That means other stuff should be, uh, um, other stuff should be going up, and we're getting nice, nice good move on Apple. Uh, pretty much broke out of our, I think that was our range that we were, we got in somewhere, I think it was around here. Uh, so we're up six bucks on Apple, probably the... Uh, um, calls are looking pretty nice. Um, the uh, DBA trade looking really good now back into where it was. And as long as corn and wheat do their deal, I bet we and interest rates drop. I think we're going to, I think, well, who knows? Too many plus and minuses there. Uh, I'm in the trade. Added to the diamond calls yesterday. It looks like we're right at break even today. So nothing too fancy to report there. Everything is... I mean, Apple's ripping. DBA is looking really good. Um, tech's holding up. I'm feeling good about life. Um, let me go back and look at some of the... Um, uh, I realize my phones are off. Very hard unless I uh, have equity in a... Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, which is basically investing, having equity. So the comment would be very hard to double your income every, uh, every quarter. Um, unless you have equity in a high growth business, true. So uh, back to the startup investing stuff that I was talking about. Um, 
So uh, yeah, sales and residuals, sure, you can get all that sort of stuff. Uh, um, if uh, the um, true, but the, you know, the thing is, is that uh, it's still, you're not doing it in an hour a day. So that, that's kind of the point I'm getting at. You know, if you can find something that you can start today, brand new, start today, spend an hour a day on it and, and you know, make that as opposed to spending 10 years in sales or something like that, or a startup. Uh, a lot of people will run around, run through alleyways and farm aluminum cans and et cetera from people's recycling, also break and enters into garage. Yep, exactly. It's, I mean, it's the state of the world. So do what makes you happy, inspire somebody. You'd have money on impact. Paul, thanks, Chris. Timely for me as I am doing a trading plan, et cetera, for Maverick tryout. Lots of great ideas to contemplate. Good. Uh, look, follow this strategy, Paul. It works on any of the um, uh, any of the uh, um, props out there that are that are worth doing. Uh, Mavericks great, love them, and especially their software. Great people, great bunch of guys. Um, I was a mentor there for uh, almost a year, I guess six months. Um, after it was all said and was done, a um, little bit more. Uh, and there's some people here who met who met us joined here because they were from Maverick and the mentoring there. So good stuff, Matt G. Thank you, Matt, Neely, or unless you make very hard, easy. Yeah. Also, Neely, I was at uh, Pioneer Town. Have you ever done a shoot up there? Oh, yeah, there was, there was uh, ADs left and right. Uh, <laughs> it's just such a there's such a, it's such an obvious, like, who are the ADs on set? You can see who the ADs are. There's just such a, I don't know why, it, I don't know what it is, but there is a stereotypical look that they all, whether it's the, it's the clothing, it's the way they hold, wear their radios, it's the butt pack, it's the, you know, the, the where they, how they move around the set, how they kind of, because it, it had been 15 years since I'd been on set. Yeah. <laughs> It'd been about 15 years since I'd been on a set, but it was just so obvious because, you know, so many, so much time grinding, just sitting there for 12 hour, 15 hour days. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of funny when you, I see them there, we, we were up there and they're like, uh, <laughs> mad respect for their job. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Grips with their, uh, tool belt and cargo shorts. Uh, there's one guy, I'm sure you guys have worked with him, but he is such a, he was such a, uh, like a eighties rocker. Uh, so funny. I got for his name. He has such good energy. Sorry. Let me, let me go that. Um, thanks Mike. It, I, I like the presentation. Uh, that's pitch every network marketing company uses. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Should, uh, I know, I, I know, man. <laughs> Uh, it's so funny that people just throw a uniform on, right? Usually a nickname cowboy. <laughs> uh, always doing like air guitar. That's kind of funny. Having that discussion. Yeah. Mad respects for ADs, but yeah, they, uh, they do the work, but you can tell when the, you know, the top AD, like it's just, they've earned that respect. You know, on the on set, like the uh, first AD, they're just like, you just, they just know how to command attention and get people to work. Uh, and the other ADs are still kind of figuring it out usually, you know. Um, and then the, the director, of course, is, just has that, uh, you know, they don't need to, you know, they don't need to do as much, I guess. Anyway, um, fun trip down memory lane. I remember they, the people I was with, they were just talking about, uh, there was like four motorhomes and trailers in kind of a parking lot. Uh, and we passed the ADs and they're like, oh yeah, you can come up here and, you know, you can probably vacation and all that sort of stuff. I'm like, no, that's the talent and the, you know, the, the directors and, and maybe editing um, on set. And they're like, oh, what do you think that? And I was like, well, are you, you think it's that sort of setup here? And I was like, there's there's about 10 people around the AD group over right there. And you know, this is about how much they make a year. So I'm guessing this is not a, not a cheaper production. So I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, they're up here doing something. 
anyway, uh, after being away from the job, minus four to six days per month, it's been so great. Good break from trading sometimes in regards to AEDs. I think it's just similar to trading management. Yep. Folks, I think that's it. This one's in the can, <laughs> as they say. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, cut it here, turn you guys loose for the day. Um, thanks, Dan. Get your 45, you know, 2 p.m., 5 p.m., whatever time zone you're in, uh, or 1 p.m. in California and in Phoenix area, 1 o'clock. We're in an hour right when the market closes, U.S. equities close. I'm in front of my screen for an hour, 45 minutes of manual backtesting, 15 minutes of scanning the markets, getting my trade set up, repeating, getting it going throwing the trades on, getting ready to go, executing trades, shutting down the platform and walking away. That's your job. All right, guys. Love you all. And I will see y'all in the slacks. <laughs>